Chapter 15 Ms. Skaggs, the Merry Widow, was our first encounter with a dude. After her, many more followed. They were impressed with our cowboys, thinking them very romantic. They were a different type of man from what Eastern women had been used to. Many of them married the cowboys. The dude, usually quite well off, furnished the wherewithal to live on. The cowboys furnished the romance. Very few of these marriages were ever a success, for the new wife would try immediately to change her husband into an Eastern gentleman, even go so far as to make him wear tails for dinner. I could never understand why a woman would marry one type of man and then try to make him into something completely different. Goshi's prediction about Hai were right. Hai did make plenty money in his writing stable. Then the inevitable happened. A wealthy divorcee fell in love with him, and they were soon married. She bought him one of the P.F. Company's ranches on the east side of Tool Mountain overlooking Pyramid Lake. They built a 13-room ranch house with three bathrooms. And, of course, Hai dressed in tails for dinner. They lived a drunken and hilarious life for a few years. And then one morning they found dear old Hai dead in his chair. Sometime before that, he had made it known he was wishes to be cremated and have his ashes scattered around the monument on Tool Mountain, overlooking his old homestead. In High's brief access to wealth, he had never forgotten his cowboy friend, so now his widow May wanted to continue in their good esteem. She made quite a feat out of the funeral ceremony of scattering the ashes. Every cowboy in the country around was there on horseback as this was their only means of transportation. It was six miles up the steep, torturous trail from the ranch to the top of the mountain. We must have made a queer-looking procession going up that trail. The ashes had arrived by mail from Sacramento, where the body had been shipped for cremation. First, in the funeral possession, was an old-timer of a cowboy named Johnny, a very good friend of High's. He carried the ashes and loaned High's saddled, bridled, and riderless horse with High's beautifully tooled leather boots hanging backwards on either side of the saddle. Then came the tipsy widow, and while it was yet only 10 a.m., she was already imbibed too freely. Then came the rest of the mourners and the near relations, followed by a motley crowd of cowboys, sportsmen from Reno, neighbors, and friends. As we passed through the ranch gate, one of the cowboys, who was a little tipsy also, took it into his head to give High a farewell salute and fired his gun several times into the air. This frightened High's riderless horse, which began to buck and tear around. While he was still bucking, he managed to get the lead rope under the tail of Johnny's horse, which also began to buck, nearly unseating old Johnny, who was trying to calm his horse, keep a tight hold on the ashes and lead rope, and, at the same time, trying to stay in his saddle. With two horses carrying on, the empty boots and High's saddle flapping up in the air, and... The antics of Johnny's horse was going through, and the cowboys kayaying in the background, yelling, Stay with him, Johnny! Stay with him! It was a hilarious scene for several minutes. Eventually, we were able to calm the horses and wound our way slowly up the mountain. Arriving at the monument, May and Johnny dismounted and walked slowly around and around the big rock pile. Everyone began to sing, When it's roundup time in Texas, only we changed the words a little. When it's roundup time on tool and the bloom is on the sage. We all intoned it mournfully, as a strange coincidence, the yellow sagebrush that blooms in the fall was in full flower. Round and round we rode, following May and Johnny singing cowboy songs all the while. As we marched, May was trying violently to scatter the ashes, but she seemed to be having difficulty. Evidently, the crematorium had not a, gun, a good job of cooking high, and soon she became exasperated. Stopping, she handed us... She handed the box to Johnny and said loud enough for us all to hear, See, here, see if you can get the damn stuff out of there. It was no easier for Johnny to remove the ashes and bones, for they were bones and, and are bones lying there to this day. Finger bones, toe bones, and teeth. After 40 years, they can still be found there. It was 40 years in 19... 60. I believe she died in the 60s, and this book was printed in the 70s, so you never know. Maybe you can still find High's finger bones up there. While Johnny was in the process of scattering the ashes, we all went gallantly on singing cowboy songs. It was a funeral long to be remembered in this part of our country. Usually when a man's ashes are scattered, that's the end. But May wanted to do a little bit more for High. She had a silver plaque made with his name engraved on it and placed it at the foot of the monument, intending to have it cemented on. She never got around to doing it. 
A sheep herder coming up on the plaque stole it, thinking he could get some money for it. Finding it had no commercial value, he brought it back. Two years later, while riding on the mountain one day, I found it lying several hundred yards away from the monument. I picked it up and placed it at the base where it originally had been placed. On my next trip, I took along some cement and fastened it securely to the monument. May didn't lo have long to grieve over High, for in a very short time she drank herself to death. Her body was shipped east and was accompanied to the depot by only one attendant, for we all felt she had been the cause of our beloved High's untimely death. There was only one dude in a cowboy marriage that I know of that was a success. A very dear cowboy friend of ours fell in love with a dude from Chicago and soon married her. I think the success of that match lay in the fact that the cowboy refused to change his way of living. He always said, By God, she married me as a cowboy, and a cowboy I'll remain. And he wore his Levi's to dinner. They had a little girl who miraculously grew up a talented and accomplished young lady against great odds. Her father liked to dress her in Levi's, checkered shirts, and big hats. He taught her to swear and use rough language like the cowboys. On the other hand, her mom liked to dress her in puffy ruffles and take her to social affairs in Reno. One day, while dining at the Riverside Hotel with some eastern friends of her mother's, the, one of the women was making a great fuss over the little eight-year-old, saying what a darling little girl she was. And I suppose, she said, you have a dear little pony to call your own? Much to her shocked surprise, she heard from little puffy ruffles, Hell no, damned old bastard's fourteen years old. The little girl had been after her father for some time to buy her a spirited horse like the one he rode, and the eastern lady had touched upon a tender subject and gotten the child's honest answer. It had been years since we'd filed our claim on Tom's desert land, and we had made many improvements. Daddy had drawn a map of the claim showing the location of the springs and alfalfa fields and sent it to Washington, D.C. with a request for title. Several years passed, and we wondered what was holding up the title. We were getting a little worried about the delay, when one day a man drove out in a big car and came to the door, acting very officious and stern, and inquired for Mr. Olds. Daddy had gone to town that morning with the team and wagon, and I told the gentleman Daddy wouldn't be back for three days, but perhaps I could answer his questions. He told me that he was a government agent from the land office in Washington, D.C., and had been sent out to inspect the improvements on our desert claim. He would decide whether our request for title would be granted or refused. I gladly and rather proudly showed him around the land. I took him to our tunnel and had him walk back into it, and I showed him the irrigated fields and the fencing. When he finished the inspection, he had a big <laughs> smile on his face. Well, this is one on Uncle Sam, he said. The men in the U.S. land office think desert land is being flat, level country, and they couldn't ex understand your husband's map and explanation of running a tunnel into a hill to irrigate a field below. It just couldn't be done. After waiting and debating it for three years, they had sent this man clear across the country to evict Mr. Olds from that land. Then he added, I just wish I could show the fellows in that Washington your tunnel in that alfalfa field. I guarantee you'll receive your title as soon as I get back to Washington. The title indeed arrived in the mail shortly thereafter. We now had 280 acres of land and a four-room house. We were still gaining and prospering, slowly but surely. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm